It would seem like the country of Iraq and heavy metal wouldn't belong in the same sentence, but to some Iraqi youth who grew up against a backdrop of war and chaos it makes total sense. In today's video, I want to do something different and talk about Iraq's heavy metal scene. In March of 2003, the United States invaded Iraq and toppled its government within a few weeks, but almost immediately following the invasion, chaos would ensue and large-scale looting and a multi-faced insurgency sprouted up to fight the Americans over the next eight years or so. It was in November of 2003, a reporter for MTV traveled to Baghdad, Iraq's capital, to do some reporting on the heavy metal scene. The article would eventually be published the following year in Vice magazine, and by November of 2003, it was clear that politicians in Washington had no idea how to manage post-war Iraq. Violent attacks against Americans and civilians were pretty much a daily occurrence and made the nightly news. The Vice magazine article would state, and I quote, most people in Baghdad don't leave their houses at night, they don't rent movies, they don't go to the bars, mostly they sit huddled in their dingy shacks and wait and watch and hope that the occupying army will lift curfew, adding, there's an inescapable feeling of terror and doom everywhere. If you think about it, Iraq was the perfect breeding ground for young people with no future hope to express their feelings through music. The band profiled in the Vice article would be Iraq's first and only metal band at the time called the Krasakauda, which formed sometime in 2000 or 2001 when Saddam Hussein was still in power. Their name in English meant Black Scorpion, which is prevalent throughout Iraq. They would take inspiration from bootleg tapes of Metallica, Slayer, and Mayhem that they got their hands on during the mid 90s. The Krasakauda would be made up of teenage headbangers Marwan Hussein, Faraz Al Latif, Faisal Talal, and Tony Aziz. Their drummer Marwan would tell Rolling Stone, Back in 1995 or 1996, we started hearing Metallica and I discovered Scorpions doing Wind of Change, something I couldn't find in pop or mainstream music there. They were addressing global issues. It spoke to me and the rest of the band members, and we wanted to be like that. Everyone else was hailing and praising, referring to Saddam Hussein's government. Prior to the Americans entering the country in 2003, most foreign of heavy music were banned, although strangely enough one article I came across claimed that western acts like Shania Twain and Danny Minogue were played on the airwaves along with traditional Islamic songs. Marwan would add how they were actually allowed to operate during Saddam's era, revealing, we did one song for the government because we needed to or we would have been shut down or imprisoned. It was following the invasion that electricity was intermittent in Baghdad so the band powered their basement rehearsal space with generators and carried weapons with them to safely make it to and from practice. While western music wasn't out right band in post-war Iraq, playing or listening to that type of music could attract unwanted attention, specifically in the form of religious extremists or insurgents opposed to coalition forces and western influences. Those who played or listened to that type of heavy music in Iraq were branded as Satanists, and the band would be inundated with death threats and had some pretty close calls. The rehearsal space was hit by a missile, two of the members were almost killed by a car bomb, while another member's home was hit by mortar fire. Vice would return to Iraq in the summer of 2006 to document where the band was actually at in a documentary called heavy metal in Baghdad. The situation in the country was exponentially worse than it was in 2003 as it seemed like a civil war was breaking out between the religious sects in the country and neighbors were now turning on each other. Add to that an insurgency that showed no signs of slowing down and the country was on the brink of falling apart. One of the band members would tell Vice, you've got a civil war outside. You've got the troops and you got the terrorists outside and we're stuck in the middle. I'm a civilian. I've done nothing wrong in my life. I didn't steal. I didn't kill. I didn't do nothing. That's a democracy we've got now. So I'm like, this democracy. It was in 2004 the band's frontman fled Iraq after receiving threats against his life. Making matters worse was that it was pretty difficult to get gigs in post-war Iraq as the band would get the odd gig but they had to be done in secret and security was another major concern. Add to that frequent power interruptions and it could be frustrating for the band and the attendees. It was against this terrifying backdrop of constant war that Iraqi youth started getting into metal and hard rock mostly as a way to escape the daily horrors of life. You could walk down some markets in Baghdad and other parts of the country and see CDs or merchandise from bands like Slayer, Megadeth, or Metallica being sold. It was alluring to some of these kids as songs like Megadeth's Holy Wars, The Punishment Do, spoke directly to them and it was almost autobiographical. But run into the wrong person and you could be physically injured or worse, killed. It was during the course of 2006 the members of Across Akauda slowly escaped to Syria, which believe it or not at the time was much more stable. But it lacked any kind of vibrant rock or metal scene and also the government had some pretty strict restrictions. The band would land a gig at a local hotel, but they had to do cover songs since the attendees weren't really familiar with their catalog. The band members slowly moved to Turkey where they were helped out by Vice with some money and the company tried to work with the United Nations to get them visas that would just allow them to tour and play in addition to trying to get them safely out of the country and relocated to either the United States, Canada, or Germany. It was in 2007 that Vice released the documentary Heavy Metal in Baghdad at the Toronto International Film Festival where it was showered with awards and critical accolades. But the documentary also resulted 
resulted in the band members coming to the attention of insurgents and extremists who inundated them with death threats. It was in 2009 the band would finally resettle to New Jersey as refugees. They continued to play their music and even landed an opening spot for the band ministry without Jorgensen telling one publication that the Iraqi heavy metal band was his and I quote, favorite metal band in the world. It was even during their second day in the States, they were invited to a Metallica show, got to meet each of the band members, and their meeting with James Heffield was actually caught on camera, as you can see here. Here you go. This is for you. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Just because the band members were now safe in America, life didn't necessarily get any easier. They'd been excommunicated by some of their family members back home, and they were barely making ends meet working at odd jobs in the service industry, at bars, restaurants, and local grocery stores. It was in the subsequent years the band members would become American citizens and started playing gigs in and around New York and New Jersey. It was in 2010 they released their first EP, and they would also play shows with gear donated by musical instrument companies, and their first EP would actually be produced by Alex Skolnick of the metal group Testament, who they actually happened to see during their time in Turkey. Fast forward to 2015 and the band released what will be their first full-length studio record called Gilgamesh, which was funded through online donations. Band member Marwan Hussein would recall to the New York Times what life in America had been like for the past half a decade or so, saying, we had to fit in the mold and adapt to a lot of different traditions and cultures. Let's put it this way. Say you're a fifth grader and your parents move a lot. You have to change schools every day. You gotta make new friends every day. New bullies will find you every day. The new atmosphere that revolves around you changes and magnify that 100 times. Since 2016, 2017 though, the band hasn't been very active, and since their inception, I should also point out that since coming to America, the band has also underwent some lineup changes. It was in 2013, Vice would return to Iraq to see what the country looked like 10 years after the invasion. It's important to note that American troops pulled out sometime in 2011, and Akras Akauda's original singer who left the country would actually be part of that documentary as he returned home to see his mother. It was during that piece that Vice ran, they also mentioned something that was in the news around 2011, that Iraq was having a problem with emo kids being targeted and murdered murdered by religious zealots. It was in the same piece Vice would cover another metal group called Dogface Corpse, who I kid you not rehearsed across the street from a religious cleric who would get pretty pissed off at the noise coming from their place. You may be wondering, what does the metal scene look like these days in Iraq? Well, between 2003 and 2011, millions of Iraqis fled their home country. The years that followed were made only worse by the civil war in neighboring Syria and the rise of ISIS. In more recent years though, as ISIS has been decimated, a new metal scene has emerged in Iraq, with bands being more political, attacking the Iraq government and the religious establishment, but that still comes with consequences. The members of Dogface Corpse would reveal to Vice that threats in Iraq aren't just limited to kids who dress emo or metal musicians, but even Iraqis who play classical music too. Perhaps one of the best known acts to sprout off from the country recently is a group called Dark Phantom. Their origins dated back to 2007 when the members were introduced to heavy metal and hard rock by the American soldiers who were stationed in the country. While the band's hometown, the northern city of Kirkuk, doesn't have a very vibrant metal scene being limited to 25-30 people, no venues actually allow them to play there, but the band has managed to play some shows in Iraqi Kurdistan and in neighboring Syria as part of a metal music festival in 2019. As of 2022, there still are bands in Iraq playing heavy metal, and now women are showing up to the shows too. The website Ideas Beyond Borders would profile one Baghdad band named Dead Tears, who played a gig to 200 fans at a wedding hall. But playing music is still a difficult dream for those bands, as many venues don't want that type of music being played on their property, and invitations for these gigs have to be done in secret amongst friends to not solicit unwanted attention. But what many people who are not part of the scene in Iraq don't understand is that it provides an outlet and bonding for people who have went through collective trauma. Faisal El Matar, the founder of Ideas Beyond Borders, would write on his blog, metal music both helped me escape and also helped me experience the reality of my situation. I couldn't relate to happy songs because there wasn't much happiness going on outside of my house and friendship circles. The depression wasn't in my head, rather it was outside of it. Heavy metal music was an outlet for my feelings in an environment where I felt stuck and silenced. The teenagers who grew up in Baghdad during this time, referring to 2006, came away with deep scars, both physical and mental. I think many of us felt a kinship with the anger and veracity that metal music embodies. Heavy metal music screamed the way that I wish I could. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Let me know how you guys felt about this story compared to what I typically cover on my channel. We'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.